Okay. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the SANS podcast. What do I need to know about F5 Network's big IP RC vulnerability with Dr. Johannes Schilwerk? Uh, Dr. Ulrich is a SANS faculty fellow, founder of the Internet Storm Center, and also host of the SANS ICS Daily Stormcast, a daily podcast providing a brief summary of current network security related events. Uh, if you have questions uh, for Dr. Ulrich during the podcast, during the webcast, pardon me, please enter them into the QA window at any time while we'll look back at those. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording will be available for viewing later today on the SANS registration page. Uh, and with that, uh, here is Dr. Ulrich. Yeah, thanks for the great introduction, Randall. So uh, we'll be talking here a little bit about the F5 a big IP vulnerability. Now, what I'm going to talk about a lot of this is what we sort of collected here at the Internet Storm Center uh, with our Honeypot uh, network. And uh, maybe dur during the webcast, I'll actually connect uh, to uh, one of our Honeypots and we can see sort of uh, what kind of traffic is coming in there. And well, um, I have to mention it today. Today's actually sort of the 20th birthday of the Shield.org, the data collection engine behind the Internet Storm Center registered domain just about 20 years ago, uh, today on July 7th in 2000. Site didn't actually go live until around Thanksgiving. Uh, that's sort of when uh, I actually uh, coded uh, the, the back end and such uh, for it. But uh, anyway, so um, let's get started with this. Title here is F5 Big IPs Remote Code Execution Vulnerability. Well, that's certainly a good part of what we'll be talking about here. But I just want to point out that uh, this is not supposed to be sort of a big you know, F5 uh, slaughter fest or so. Uh, these vulnerabilities are sadly somewhat common in this group of devices. Actually, at the um, uh, RSA conference uh, earlier this year, like when was it, March or February, uh, I talked as part of our science panel about just this issue that we see researchers really sort of zooming in on all of these in particular web applications and uh, that sort of run uh, these perimeter devices and then of course uh, turn these perimeter security devices against you. And uh, this F5 uh, vulnerability is just the latest example of that. Actually, just today, Citrix released another uh, set of vulnerabilities. I sort of see Citrix F5 sort of as close competitors in this space. And uh, there's again uh, one actually code execution vulnerability in Citrix, a little bit more tricky to exploit than some of the prior ones. Or then this one, it actually requires a, a login user to sort of do something and download a file uh, to. Um, they actually exploit it, but still, I just want to point this out here. So I want to talk quickly about what Big IP is all about, and then of course the vulnerability, uh, some of the current exploits uh, that we are seeing and how they work, how do you detect if you are compromised, and in the end I want to talk a little bit about you know, protecting the systems in a more generic way, and also how this vulnerability may affect you even though you are not using uh, these F5 Big IP devices. That's uh, certainly a part here. So um, this is a little uh, cartoonish sketch here of what it's all about. Typically, uh, these devices sit between, on the one hand, the internet, on the other hand, uh, your web server, your web application infrastructure, F5 uh, Big IP has a number of features that it provides. It's uh, often described as a load balancer, uh, but it really does a lot more than just sort of a classic load balancer does. So yes, load balancing, the big feature here. It's also a web application firewall. And then it can also, uh, and it partly has to do this as part of its, uh, to provide, for example, web application firewalling and, and load balancing, it does decrypt TLS. Uh, so it basically plays uh, here a machine in the middle uh, between your client and the actual web service, can do authentication to web services and uh, lots and lots of other features like this. But essentially the way you can think about it is an HTTP, HTTPS request comes in, uh, the big IP inspects it and then may redirect it to a particular backend server, uh, may, like I said, decrypt, encrypt it, uh, filter it. So lots and lots of things uh, can happen here. Now, how popular are them? These are big, expensive devices. So it's not something that, you know, every business has sort of in their uh, 
uh, in their closet hidden away somewhere. Uh, according to Shodan, there are about 8,000 exposed devices. Uh, so there are probably more out there, but these 8,000 exposed ones, and, and I'll get to this a little bit later, uh, is what we are really worried about. Uh, now, over the last uh, week, uh, there were a couple of sort of uh, internet-wide scans where they looked into how many of these devices are actually vulnerable. 2,000-ish uh, is sort of the numbers uh, people come back with uh, at this point of uh, those 8,000 devices are vulnerable. There may, of course, be more devices uh, that are better protected, that are still vulnerable, uh, but not reachable, and as such, uh, less likely going to get attacked. So this is uh, taken directly from F5's uh, support document. And then F5, I think, did a real great job here in sort of pointing out the severity of this vulnerability. So they didn't really sort of uh, talk around the problem here. Um, it's unauthenticated, so no user authentication required. Any random user on the internet can do it and can then execute arbitrary system commands, and which then can lead to a complete system compromise. So uh, this really puts it down there. Now in green, I highlighted the part when I earlier mentioned exposed devices. The control plane, the actual administrative interface, should not be exposed to the internet. That's really sort of the root cause of a lot of these issues uh, that we have here. And um, so um, when I talked earlier, let me just go back here about these 8,000 exposed devices. These are 8,000 devices that actually have uh, their admin interface exposed uh, to the internet. Now, as far as versions go, uh, F5 is pretty good in supporting uh, older versions. So they're going down here to version 11. Uh, pretty much all currently supported versions are vulnerable. That's uh, what you should get from this chart here. Don't get hung up on uh, the detailed version numbers. If you didn't patch your F5 last week, you are vulnerable. That's sort of the quick summary here. Uh, June 30th, so Tuesday last week, just a week from today, is when the patch was released. And uh, anything before that is vulnerable. Now, uh, one of our Net Storm Center handlers, um, he had an 11.61, so that's like the earliest supported version still sitting in his, in his network. Um, first of all, if you have a version that's that old, so I'm talking about 11.61 here, not 11.65, uh, you probably have an entire slew of vulnerabilities that you haven't been patched against yet, uh, but he actually wasn't able to exploit uh, this vulnerability. Uh, not really sure if some of these older versions don't necessarily have all the features enabled uh, by default. We uh, didn't really have, this was a production device, so uh, didn't really have a chance to uh, dive into it uh, deeper. So what's the problem? The problem is with uh, what uh, F5 calls the traffic management user interface, or more colloquially known as the configuration utility. So, um, this is essentially a web application that's installed uh, within the device that does provide you with an administrative interface. The way you get to it is uh, here, HTTPS, and by the way, it's only accessible via HTTPS. These devices will not respond to HTTP. By default, they have sort of some self-signed certificate set up here. Uh, then you connect to the host name. And then TMUI, that's short for Traffic Management User Interface. And then the vulnerable part here is login.jsp. So what's the problem here? The exploit is, as we had it with the Citrix issue, trivial. It's a dot dot semicolon. You know, so one of these code injection issues. And then you can follow that here with a uh, a JSP that's reachable uh, by login.jsp. And uh, one of the more popular ones here, and I'll go over them, is TMSH CMD. TMSH, that's the shell CMD, so I can send a TM shell command. And here would be one command list of user admin. This will get you back a list of all the admin users, including their password hashes. So 
the vulnerable script login.jsp. Then we pass to it the actual JSP that we would like to execute, TMSH CMD in this case, and then you know, we can pass parameters uh, to this uh, Java servlet. So here are the three most commonly exploited uh, servlets that we have here. TMSH CMD, that's what I just showed you. It allows you to execute commands. Now, by default, not bash commands, but these TMSH commands. So uh, you can essentially uh, check the configuration, alter configuration. That's sort of what uh, TMSH is kind of about. You know, like many of these uh, devices have sort of their own little shell uh, where, where you can execute some basic configuration commands. That's really what TMSH is roughly about. File read allows you to read arbitrary files. File save allows you to write files. So those are the three big commands that I've seen uh, exploited uh, here um, uh, on vulnerable devices. There are a couple others that are sometimes being used. Uh, get tab set .jsp. I believe this is really more checked uh, if this is an actual device or some honeypot. Um, you basically use this to retrieve a tab uh, within the user interface. Typically you'll see a tab name being passed to it as a parameter that doesn't exist and then uh, the attack script is looking for the error message. Off properties.jsp, I have seen that once or twice so far. Uh, it returns a JavaScript snippet, but I believe what they're after here is uh, that JavaScript, again, that's being used sort of to create the user interface uh, for uh, this uh, TMUI uh, configuration uh, interface. Uh, it has a list of, sort of authentication um, methods that are being used, so that's probably to fingerprint uh, the device somewhat. But anyway, so uh, really the biggest problem here is this TMSH CMD. Like I said, by default, the commands don't really look that severe, but still, you can change the configuration of the device. But there's one particular command that really sort of uh, makes this a uh, trivial exploitable vulnerability, and that's create alias. With create alias, I can link the list command in TMSH to bash. And so now whenever I send link, I'm actually executing bash. And with that, you, know, you get now complete command execution using bash. So uh, you have access to the complete uh, Linux uh, interface uh, of the system. So these are some of the commands here. List of user admin. Let me just change the pointer around a little bit. So here, list of user admin. Uh, this would be a standard TMSH command. that just returns the lister, the users, including uh, password hashes. But what you're likely going to see is like create CLI alias private list command bash. This will now create a link between list and bash. And after you send this command, anybody that sends list will actually execute bash. Now, if you send the same command again, you'll actually get an error that this alias already exists. Uh, so the other command you often see is that the attacker will clean up afterwards and delete that alias again. Now, this is sort of what the complete URL looks like. You know, so TMSH command, you create the alias. And then the next thing the attacker will typically do is they'll write a file to slash temp. The content of the file, so the way this file safe works is we pass the file name and the content. And uh, so they basically save that file and uh, then uh, they will use list now because list is an alias for bash to execute that command by executing the file. So typically you'll see three commands being sent by the attacker. First, create the alias. Second, create the file. And then finally, executing the file. Now, this is the typical sequence here uh, that you have. Now, if you want to test yourself uh, to check if you're vulnerable, uh, what I found to be sort of one of the more reliable tests is uh, don't create uh, the alias and such. You may mess up other things there. Uh, so I highly recommend not to do that. You know, don't create the alias. Um, you may actually break stuff if you do that. Uh, but um, just testing the file read command, 
you can retrieve that Etsy F5 release file. It's a little JSON uh, file and it lists the current version of the F5 big IP that you're running. Uh, so not only if it works, you're vulnerable, but secondly, you also know what version you're running. Uh, so you know what upgrade path to use. And uh, this is probably the, the simplest and uh, least likely to cause harm way uh, to sort of scan uh, your device, your vulnerable. And literally all you have to do is uh, uh, run this with curl, you know, just fill in your IP address here of your device uh, and, um, and that'll work. Now, how do you detect if someone already tried to exploit uh, your system? The one uh, kind of bad part I find about this is uh, that there is no, by default, uh, there is no web server access lock. There's an error lock, but there's no access lock for it. So you have to find other locks uh, to, uh, to basically get uh, the access attempts. Uh, you could theoretically use a network like you no. Know, uh, Cisco, for example, release source snort signatures, but remember, all the hits to that admin interface are over HTTPS. Uh, so your classic IDS is not going you doing you much good here. Uh, yes, maybe you are doing some TLS uh, decryption, but then again, that's usually what the F5 is for. So uh, uh, maybe a little bit of chicken neck thing where the device is actually does your TLS encryption is the device that. Um, that is vulnerable here. Uh, so IDSs, net, so classic network IDSs, I think have limited value here. On the device itself, uh, you have the audit log. That's a standard Linux audit log. And uh, you can actually check for uh, the, the TMSH process is locked. And then you'll find like the command data here. So this would be uh, what you find in that log uh, for anybody that's trying to delete the alias, you would also set a, see the setup of the alias and such. Uh, so that's probably your, the quickest log to, to check for exploit attempts is this. Um, and then of course, yeah, the status command okay is not a good thing. Okay? Um, but um, so other ways to look uh, for a successful exploit. Uh, typically these file, files end up in slash temp. Now, there are a number of other directories, var SHM, and I think there's user temp. So your standard Unix directories uh, where the user Tomcat can write to, and that's the user that creates those files. Um, I have only seen files being written to slash temp at this point in my honeypots. However, I would recommend if you don't see anything in slash temp, um, I would recommend you just search the file system for files that are owned by the user Tomcat. There is a very small list of files that you legitimately get back there. Uh, so it should be easy to spot uh, any unusual files. Other things that I've seen these exploits do so far, they make themselves persistent via an ad entry to cron, so uh, check cron tab you know, if anything was added there. Uh, Etsy password, uh, one exploit, and I've only seen this once so far, they add an additional admin user. Uh, so uh, check that, you should see that user at the end of Etsy password. Uh, and then so you know, standard Unix tricks like initd, we just actually saw that uh, about an hour ago, I saw uh, something uh, Renato pointed out to me, uh, he was watching the honeypot right now. So standard Unix stuff, you know, there are more spots, but uh, you should see something in slash temp. Uh, that's the most likely spot where you'll see these files. Now, uh, there will also be some session files that are legitimate. Uh, they start with ses underscore. Um, yes, it's possible an attacker will use that, that file naming scheme. Uh, but uh, typically you will see a couple dozens or so at this point of files in slash temp. And then when you look at the files, they basically have little bash commands in them. That's what the attacker uh, exploited. More advanced exploits. Now these are things I have not seen yet, but that's really what an attacker would do with this device once he sort of got a hold of it. I rules, that's the rule language uh, that F5 uses to redirect uh, requests. An attacker could easily use this to inject malicious JavaScript. So to redirect a request 
for, let's say, jQuery or whatever to point to their own JavaScript. Uh, so uh, things like mage cards that inject uh, keystroke loggers and such. Uh, it's an exploit made for them. And the danger here is that all the websites behind that F5 uh, device uh, are potentially affected. Uh, so um, this is something that goes beyond the actual device and would affect uh, web applications that are protected by this device. So how do you fix this? Well, I put this in an obnoxious comic sans font because this is really what this all comes down to. Do never ever expose the admin interface on any of these devices. And this is not an F5 problem. All of these devices, including F5, they give you lots and lots of hints on how to limit access uh, to uh, the admin interface. So follow that advice. Um, require a VPN or something like this uh, to connect to it. Uh, that's really what you have to do. There's a workaround that uh, F5 published and it's pretty straightforward. Basically, if the URL includes dot dot semicolon, that's really what it's looking for. So dot dot semicolon, then return a 404. Now uh, with that, if you run that test I showed you earlier and you get a 404 back, the reason may be that this workaround was put in place, not that the device was patched. So when you're getting 404s back, is maybe an indication of the workaround. Um, but that's, um, that's kind of what uh, this workaround does. Now, what about if you're not running an F5, a big IP? Why is it still a problem for you? Well, uh, because these days, developers love to include so JavaScript and such from various third-party websites. Nobody ever copies it to their own site. They all leave it on some kind of CDN. Big famous, of course, things like jQuery and such. And, um, and of course, recently, I'm not sure if you saw that, but um, which bank? Uh, Barclays. Barclays was uh, found uh, in hosting actually some JavaScript on archive.org. Um, so anyway, uh, all of this JavaScript, of course, is now at risk if the website that is hosting it is behind a vulnerable F5 big IP device. Uh, so this goes beyond this vulnerability. This is a problem even without having vulnerable F5 big IPs around. And I just want to put this in here uh, because this is sort of a point that I'm really emphasizing lately in our Defending Web Application class and such. Uh, that's sort of every talk about this quite a bit. And that's sub-resource integrity. Uh, there is a relatively simple fix for this. If you insist in hosting your JavaScript you know, on another website, you can actually add a hash. That's this sub-resource integrity hash uh, to your script or your link tag. Also works with style sheets. And with that, uh, you can tell uh, the browser, hey, if, if that hash doesn't match, you know, don't load that JavaScript or, or that style sheet. Uh, you definitely have to include this. Um, websites include uh, sometimes dozens of different scripts that are hosted on different sites. Uh, and this is how you're keeping yourself secure. Now, um, your argument may be, what if they update that JavaScript? Well, you probably want to know about that. Uh, and actually, usually, if you do it right, like jQuery does that, for example, as part of the filing here, you have the exact version numbers. You're not just including jQuery, you're including a specific version of jQuery. Um, so, and uh, then this integrity uh, feature should work quite well. Uh, so definitely include that. Uh, like I said, it really helps you way beyond uh, just uh, that, uh, that particular uh, one issue. Now, before we go to the questions, I want to show you a little bit uh, the actual um, exploits and how they all work. So let me just get out of the presentation here and um, show this little shell with you, uh, just so, so you kind of see what to expect. Um, That should get me in there, yeah. 
So I just SH now uh, to my uh, system. And um, let me go to the temp directory here. Uh, so here you have these session files and they're actually owned by Apache. Uh, they're normal. Uh, these session files are normal. That was just me logging into the admin interface. Uh, there, there are a couple more down here. And then we have these random usually named files. Uh, let me first uh, get you some that's <coughs> very common. Actually, CMD. I see them off naming it CMD. So, yeah, and they usually just put ID in it. Yeah, that's a little vulnerability check. Of course, they're just trying to execute ID to see who they're running as. Um, this PJ one here looks new, so let's see what they're doing with this one. Ah, that's actually where they are adding um, a new administrator. So here they're adding this administrator. Uh, this is the second time I see that uh, same uh, password here. And then if you're looking at um, Etsy password, oh, uh, didn't add it, uh, probably because I already removed it and it was still uh, in the, um, as a user account in the, for the, for the web uh, admin interface. Uh, but first time that happened, it also added it here uh, to Etsy password. Uh, so this may not have worked here because the user already existed in F5's user database and not in the Unix one. And uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, let's try this LX one. Yeah, here they just echo RCE. So uh, just checking if, um, if you're vulnerable again, and then looking if that string comes back. And uh, G, yeah. This here was an interesting one. This actually doesn't do anything the way it's written here. Um, whoever wrote this has to pipe this uh, to a bash or something like that, the output of that curl command. Yeah? And um, I think last time I checked, uh, this also didn't work uh, because that uh, web server here uh, didn't allow me to connect. Uh, but um, let's just see what happens now. I can connect now. But basically curl by default just sends uh, the output is standard out. Uh, so there is no, uh, nothing here catching it yet. It doesn't even connect. So um, any other? Yeah, this is the right way of doing it. Uh, so here it's curl and then it pipes it to SH. And um, curl the SH here. Uh, this is a funny one. It's actually sort of adding a cron job if you run it uh, to continuously pull this URL. I filed a abuse report against the I ISP. It's a Ukrainian ISP. And the result is that the IP I'm running this from here uh, can no longer access uh, the site. Uh, other sites uh, may still work. Uh, be of course careful uh, with this. Yeah? So these are some of the exploits here in it. Uh, just showing you the audit log. And this is your audit log. And then you see here, you know, some of the, like delete, uh, I think it was the delete here. And um, the cannot load user credentials, I think is unrelated. Uh, here, someone is trying to create the list alias, but it already exists. Uh, so these are kind of your typical exploit attempts uh, that that you have here uh, that, that are reflected in the um, in the audit log. Now uh, for uh, this system, I also uh, enabled an access log, but like I said, that's not enabled uh, by default. And uh, let me make this a little bit more readable here. Just pulling out the URLs and make that a little bit easier. A lot of stuff that hits this device is just basic stupid exploits that are not at all related uh, to um, some of, actually uh, to some of this. Uh, where do we have uh, something? 
Yeah, but here you, know, here you have that file save. Yeah. That's the TMSH command. Usually it works with, um, uh, it works with uh, get, but you sometimes see it with a post. And uh, this here was probably the user that add himself as a user, then logging in. I have to double check uh, if, if that's the case here uh, with this. Um, now, let me just show you uh, the test. Let's uh, run some uh, exploits here against this. And uh, let me just go back here and copy some that I have. So uh, this is the you know, F5 release. Let's see what we have here. So this is where you get back. Here I'm running uh, 15101. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the release I'm running here. Uh, dot five uh, is the, five, dot four or five is the, the latest one. So I'm a couple minor uh, versions behind here. And then uh, let me set up that alias. So here's where I'm setting up the alias. Okay, uh, this empty error, empty output, that's fine. Yeah, that, that's success, uh, that output. And uh, do I have something where I can save a file? Yeah. So yeah, I'm saving to temp test yeah, content ID. Oh. Scroll. Okay, no output, which is good. And then we can try uh, to execute this. So uh, here I'm now using list because I defined this as an alias for bash uh, to execute this. And let's see if it works, yeah. And you see here, I get my output ID. Yeah. And uh, that's the other thing here. These commands run as root. Yeah. Um, the, actual, uh, the actual web server in Tomcat runs as Tomcat and Apache. But once you're invoking TMSH, it runs as root. Yeah. So uh, the attacker has full root access to the system. Yeah. When they write the file, there is still a Tomcat. So that's why they can only write to a location where Tomcat can write the file to. But then they could easily, for example, use this to then create other files. That's why they can create uh, add cron entries to root. Um, that's why they can add users to Etsy password and such, uh, because the script itself runs as root. So anyway, let me check. You had a number of questions here, and I don't want to keep you here too long for a quick. Um, webcast like this. So let me just look at the questions I have. Um, so the first question is a really good question. If an enterprise uh, doesn't expose uh, the management, uh, let me move this over here, uh, interface, but the management interface is still exposed to uh, the internal network. Is there a danger from a bad actor with a foothold in the network? Yes. And you know, remember, there was also no cross-site request forging token. In order to exploit this remotely, if you're exposing this internally, all I need to do is uh, set up a web page like, uh, let me just do a little impromptu, uh, image source equals, if your users inside your network hits that URL, uh, the browser will then send a request to that URL from inside your network. And uh, if the attacker knows the internal IP address or host name of your uh, device, uh, then uh, this uh, could make the exploit work. And all the attacker now needs is, well, you know, uh, three image tags. One to create the alias, one to write the file, one to send the exploit. And um, they could theoretically even then use that uh, to expose the admin interface and, and work from there. Um, 
Is there much danger of not upgrading if the big IP is locked down and mitigated? So um, applying this particular um, rule uh, to the Apache configuration does block this access, this, this exploit, does block it well as far as I can tell. Um, I would still upgrade for the reason there were a number of other vulnerabilities that were addressed in this update. Uh, Cross-site scripting vulnerabilities and such that are not as easy and straightforward to exploit as this one. Uh, it's still something you, you don't want to take care of, uh, but uh, you can wait a couple weeks to do that. Uh, so uh, this, this fix uh, will stop the bleeding. And it's definitely something you should do. And I know it's not always that easy to upgrade uh, these devices, particularly if you're behind a few versions. Uh, should the access logs for the big IP be reviewed as well as the accounts on it, both now and after it's patched? Or is there not much to worry if it isn't exposed to the internet? I would still, yeah. uh, like particularly with this, um, um, with this cross-site request forging type uh, exploit, uh, um, I would still review the logs just to make sure that you didn't receive um, you didn't receive an, uh, didn't receive a hit you know, from one of the internal users, either you know, evil internal users. I hear some people have them, or unintentionally evil ones. They just went to the wrong website that triggered uh, that cross-site uh, request forging exploit. And um, then question from Hakim here about where does the exploit occur in the F5 itself or on the back end servers? It's in the F5 itself. Uh, so that's uh, where you have this, uh, ex that's where the, the action happens. Uh, if access to the TMUI interface are restricted to only specific IP addresses, is the device still vulnerable? It's only vulnerable if the, ad if the access comes from one of the authorized uh, hosts. Uh, so, yeah, if you run script and get 403 error, uh, 403 is an authentication issue, so then probably access to that particular URL was, um, was blocked. And uh, Renato just reminds me, he actually just uh, published a quick uh, diary on the Internet Storms, our website, uh, talking about that back door that I just showed you. Uh, he actually managed to connect and analyze it. Uh, so the reason for the dot dot semicolon, the semicolon basically terminates the command and then everything after the semicolon is interpreted as a new shell command. So that's kind of significant of that uh, semicolon, dot dot semicolon, that pattern. Very classic pattern uh, uh, for web application vulnerabilities. And um, should one of the first steps be to enable the access log? Uh, I haven't found an easy way to enable the access log. <laughs> Sorry, I haven't had time to dig into it deep enough, uh, but um, yeah, it's probably a good idea to enable that. Um, the only way I did it is by changing the Apache configuration, but it's being reset whenever you, um, uh, whenever you reboot the system. Uh, so uh, not ideal. Uh, however, I have to say that I set this up as a honeypot it's not integrating the rest of my network by default. And that's really sort of how the logging is more built on the F5. It's sort of more built around some remote logging and such. And uh, you know, it's sort of one of these RTFNs, you know, redefined manual in how to enable access logging. Certainly not a bad idea. And, and you should have a low volume there. You know? uh, uh, nobody really should hit the admin interface. Uh, so uh, the log volume should be pretty low there, just an administrator going in there occasionally. And um, how long did the honeypot take to see activity? How long has it been up for this test? Um, I, this particular honeypot I set up uh, yesterday before I had simpler ones. Like this one, of course, is a full um, F5 install. And um, just to go back here, When you look at some of uh, the dates of the, and I have to move the little window out of here. Um, like uh, you see, they come in sort of every few minutes, you know, the experts. It's a little bit misleading on the other hand, uh, because this honeypot actually, I'm forwarding a bunch of IP addresses to it. Yeah. Um, but um, I would say for a single IP address, probably takes about an hour or two to see sort of your first exploit for it. Um, 
So that's a guess. Uh, I can probably do that. Uh, how can we search for vulnerable device on the internet? Uh, Shodan, uh, Shodan, of course, does that. Uh, and then Seth has an example here. Could this image tag I showed you also be triggered in email? I believe yes. Um, if you enable viewing images. And remember, this URL is for an internal system. So um, there may be even some exception that would load this image. Of course, it's an image. Uh, but yes, that's uh, an email it could certainly work there. Uh, and uh, what else do we have here? It's repeating now a little bit here uh, with the question. Uh, is there a way to set up vulnerable machines to uh, experiment with this? Um, F5 has a download for a virtual machine. That's what I'm using it here for the honeypot and you get a 30 day trial license. So that's what I'm using uh, for, for this honeypot here. And they do have some of the older versions for download. Uh, so you can download a vulnerable version if you want to. Um, if the device is compromised, the best way to get rid of it by full re-imaging the device, that's always the best thing to do. Um, so um, yes, uh, maybe have a backup, a snapshot, something like this uh, from more than a week ago, uh, then you should be reasonably safe. If you're not worried about any kind of zero day attacker hitting you with, uh, with this exploit before it was published. But I haven't seen any evidence at this point that this exploit was used in the wild uh, before uh, June 30th. Um, so you should be pretty good there. Anyway, yeah, uh, I think we have all the questions here now. Um, anyway, any other questions or so? My email address, let me just uh, put this up here. You have my email address here. You have my, uh, the you know, Storm Center's uh, URL here. Remember, it's the Shield's birthday and the Shield likes logs for its birthday as a present. So set up honeypots, help us explain these vulnerabilities better you know, by providing us with the data uh, that, uh, that can help us here. Uh, also do a daily podcast if you're not familiar with that. Uh, so if you want that quick five minute summary each morning, uh, telling you kind of what's new, uh, like uh, these type of vulnerabilities. Uh, that's what I have for today. Don't really want to keep this uh, too long. Uh, so thanks for listening. There will be a recording of uh, this uh, webcast. Also, the slides will also be made public shortly. Thanks. Yes. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for that presentation, Dr. Ulrich. Uh, to our listeners, we greatly appreciate you listening in. As Dr. Ulrich mentioned, please remember to check dshield.org, the Internet Storm Center site, for latest updates from them. Uh, and for a full schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org slash webcasts. Uh, until next time, take care, and we hope to see you back again for another webcast. Bye-bye now.